engagement. We're streaming from the Amera Innovation Exchange at Signal Hill Campus in St. John's with our hosts and our panelists in remote locations. Uh, we're also streaming live to Facebook. That allows us better access for folks and also it allows us to do live closed captioning. Uh, we're so glad to have our panelists and also you here to join us today. Uh, we acknowledge that the lands on which Memorial University's campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups. And we acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Biafic, Mi'kmaq, Inu, and Inuit of this province. We encourage everyone to reflect on these lands from where you are located and the Indigenous people for whom, for whom these lands are traditional territory. So we're looking forward to hearing from our panel about their experiences, uh, sharing their work, expertise, and knowledge with the public. As everyone is qu probably quite aware, these are very interesting times to be engaging in media and social media in particular. With that, I'd like to introduce our host for this event, airline industry expert and the Dean of the Faculty of Business Administration, Dr. Isabel Dostelet. Thank you very, very much, Rebecca. Uh, I'm really, really delighted to be uh, here with you uh, this morning. Really happy that the um, Office of Engagement reached out to me to ask me to host this panel. This is a, a topic. Public scholarship is public scholarship is a topic that is dear to my heart. As a dean, I always try to encourage faculty member to to engage in this type of of, of in this way. Uh, so we're going to have a lively discussion. The panelists we all met uh, a few weeks ago to prepare, and our discussion was so lively then that I'm pretty sure that uh, we will have a, uh, a, a great time uh, all together this morning. Uh, I will start by asking the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, I will want to perhaps um, have them give us a brief overview of their uh, public scholarship, but at the same time, perhaps they could define what it means, what is what what does it mean to be a public scholar? So perhaps the definition of public scholarship and and their own uh, practice as as public uh, scholar. So why don't I start with uh, Rod? Can I uh, invite you to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's really an honor to be asked to participate in this event. And uh, it's the first time I've ever done something like this, so it's quite exciting for me. So I'm Rod Russell. I'm in the Division of Biomedical Sciences within the Faculty of Medicine. <clears throat> I've always studied, uh, done research on viruses and the immune system. So my introduction, um, or my, I, I recently found out I was a public scholar when I got invited to, to be part of this. So until then, I didn't know I was considered a public scholar. So that's uh, an interesting thing for me. Um, Obviously, the pandemic has brought me into the world of public engagement. I was your typical scientist who spent, you know, most of my time in my lab or in my office and uh, didn't have a lot of opportunity to interact with the public, even though we tried to find ways to uh, let the public know about our work and what we're doing. Um, until you know there was a pandemic and suddenly everybody wanted to know about the virus and the vaccines and the variants um i didn't have a lot of opportunity but now in the last year and a half i've had plenty of opportunity to uh speak to the public to engage with the public and really my goal has been to try to help people understand this rapidly evolving situation we've been living in and hopefully stop living in pretty soon i think that's all for now for me Thank you very much, Rod. Uh, I'd like to now invite uh, Sobia to uh, introduce herself, tell us a bit about her own practice as a public scholar. What's her definition? What does it mean to be to be a public scholar? Hi, thanks, Isabel. Um, I'm a faculty member at the School of Social Work at Memorial University. Um, I'm an educator and anti-racist activist and uh, researcher, mother and writer. Uh, my, my work really focuses on supporting um, community engaged anti racist and social justice practice. Um, and my scholarship spans across uh, various uh, several different social concerns, including racism and racialization, violence against women, girls, and non binary folks, uh, transnational global social justice. Um, and I continue to learn from activists and artists uh, of diverse backgrounds. Um, 
here in the province, uh, including with the anti racism coalition um, and addressing Islamophobia in Newfoundland and Labrador project, which, were, which the latter was a um, public engaged scholarship uh, project that uh, Dr. Jennifer Selby and I uh, did. Um, my definition um, of public scholarship uh, really comes from the notion uh, that of of praxis, which is looking at how knowledge can be mobilized and how um, knowledge from both co from various sorts, professional, community, and academic, can, can kind of inform one another. And um, so that's my that's my definition. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Uh, I believe that Rosemary has now joined us. So, Rosemary, may I invite you to um, introduce yourself? Tell us about uh, your uh, practice as a as a public scholar. So, hi everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here today. That is a pumpkin hanging behind me, so um, it's it's in my space. So, I'm getting ready for Halloween. Um, I'm a trained sociologist. I dabble a lot in criminology and would consider myself also a criminologist. Um, probably the most significant public engagement I've done is I was behind the recognition of correctional parole and probation officers under the memorial grant, which resulted in um, a recognition of um, when occupational stress injuries happen, particularly death in, in work, that persons are recognized for that contribution and that sacrifice and put forward in positive ways. Um, my work is largely directed towards making changes and positive impacts. I impact policy, I impact practices, and I have a very applied positioning with my work, although I do theoretical work as well. And in that context, I don't fully have a definition of public, um, what it means to be a public scholar. I've kind of been flying by the seat of my pants, and every time I've been asked to do something in that context, I've put that forward and tried my best to to find ways to make positive change and to make positive change happen um, by using the knowledge that we produce through research. And when I say we, and most research has a team behind it. So it's it's not just mine and we, we move that forward and try to make the world slightly better for what that's worth. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Uh, last but not, not least, John, if I can um, invite you to introduce yourself and tell us about your uh, practice as a, as a public scholar. Hi everyone. Um, my name is John Bodner. Um, I'm a folklorist, and um, I'm out in the social cultural studies program at Grenfell Campus. And <clears throat> I think my work um, as a public scholar is, like many of us, a little bit accidental. It arises partially out of my discipline and uh, the particular school of my discipline that I belong to, where um, we're largely informed by ethnographic and fieldwork uh, methods. Uh, to live in community and to study communities of people and their culture and practices. And I think also I sort of see public scholarship as it's simply an extension of citizenship. Um, and so I've been involved in many activist activities, but I also am interested in trying to uh, in trying to have um, uh, extend out and in, and support the capacity of communities that I live in uh, with the training that I have since I've been quite privileged um, in acquiring a small subset of skills. Thank you very much for this. So very interesting, and already we have you know laid the the, the base for for an interesting discussion. Um, it's interesting how you we become uh, uh, public scholars how how it happens and you know in my case because my field is aviation it is a topic that pub the public wants to hear about for example during covid all these flights to uh, atlantic canada that were cancelled and all the that generated a lot of a lot of media interest so there seems to be and i will sort of uh, uh, launch a first question so there seems to be a link between your field and you becoming a, a public scholar. Uh, uh, Raj, you mentioned, you know, uh, studying HIV. Uh, Sobia, you talk about, about activism. Uh, is there a link? Do you think that there are fields um, from which it's, um, or in which it's easier uh, to become a public scholar or that it's more natural to, be, to become one? So what do you think? Anybody wants to jump in? Any of the panelists wants to jump in? 
I can. Um, Thank I you, Sylvia. I, I think um, <laughs> I think that um, some fields do lend themselves to an easier um, uh, connections between um, community and um, the public, I guess, and uh, and their scholarship. Um, definitely in an applied field like social work, um, you know. You know, I think that there is um, a lot of room for that, um, but I think also um, how some of us, how I ended up in social work was for very much, um, maybe not as a scholar necessarily, but the connection between, you know, uh, my love of knowledge and uh, my personal experiences of, of, um, of uh, marginalization uh, really brought me to social work. So I think that there is the field that there are fields, but I think as um, I, we, I, we've already heard some of the panelists that it, it doesn't necessarily, you don't always know. It is by mistake. A lot of times it is, it is, you get into, you get, you know, you get into these spaces where you are linking um, community and knowledge and scholarship back and forth um, sort of by happenstance. It's interesting how uh, we, we would like to believe that we have a set agenda in life, you know, when we choose academia, but then we, we realize that uh, things happen by chance, you know, so there's a, a lesson in it. We need to be humble, right? Uh, uh, opportunities present themselves to, to us and we and we size them. OK, this is a much better view. I see all the panelists now, so this should this should work better. Um, could I ask you, Rob, to jump in on that topic between um, the field that you study and, and in general, you know, do we think that some fields are 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 more, you know, a natural fit, if I if I may say, with with public scholarship. Yeah, I would say for sure. I mean, I, I as you mentioned, I did training in HIV um, years ago when I first started in research. So just you know, being working on a virus that's that's known to the public, and and you know, I was training in the late nineties when the when the first drugs for HIV were coming, and the activism. I mean, the the gay rights movement was really at its peak at that point, and that tied HIV and HIV issues to you know to ideas that everybody in the public could relate to. And even back then, of course, there was very, you know, a lot of polarizing opinion on different things. Uh, and now if we fast forward, you know, new viruses come up, Ebola, and this brings up, um, you know, the, the ethical issues about, you know, treatment available in countries that can afford it versus, you know, countries that can't afford. So, you know, these things bring virologists, immunologists, public health researchers, all researchers in that area into um, the public engagement because, you know, the, the media looks for people with expertise to comment on these things. And now, of course, the, the best example in my career is SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, where, you know, I never thought I would see so many of my colleagues and friends across the country and around the world on TV on a regular basis. And it's, it's mind blowing in a way um, that that happened. And I never thought I would be one of them. So it's, it's very interesting. Thanks for this, Rob. Sure, it made you uh, someone popular right over the <laughs> or unpopular, last we'll see. year. Depends um, on what Rob, interview I was doing. Uh, Rosemary, I like the fact that you said that you don't have a full definition of what what a public scholar is, and I, I think I, I agree with you. It, it seems to be uh, it's very much an evolving concept. But again, to you, I would have, uh, ask that question between uh, fields, you know, uh, and, and public scholarship. Are there fields that are more uh, you know, that we tend to see more in, in the public sphere, either uh, in your case or, or your colleagues around you. So, so what do you think? Well, I, I think it's interesting. All research at some point or another becomes very timely. And it's just a matter of time until the research you're doing and the topic gets picked up. So I sit in a field of mental health and public safety. And what I find is with the post-traumatic stress injuries act and different things going on that I've been kind of pushed into this more public role at times. And so I, I don't know if it's necessarily field specific, although some fields may lend themselves be themselves better to public engagement. I think the research we do in our areas of focus, and if, if you give it time and you wait, every topic becomes pertinent and things happen that bring a topic to the forefront. And that's when you have to kind of vault into, for lack of a better word, this public sphere. And I, I think it's a choice people have. We can refuse to be a public figure for these types of things. But if we don't disseminate our knowledge, 
If we don't push forward, we can't actually make an impact. And in that, in that instance, it's important to get the findings of research out and out in different ways, not just academically, not just in journal articles, but it's important to put our knowledge out in ways that it can be actualized by the persons who we're doing the research for. And public engagement in that sense, just like our research should be motivated by the persons we're talking to and giving voice to otherwise silenced populations. So I think in that sense, all research can become public and it's just a matter of time. And as I said before, I'm, I'm actually quite an introverted person. So being thrown into kind of like a light at different times based on the different work I'm doing, that as a public servant, you know, we, we might be university professors, et cetera, but in essence, we are public servants and it is our job to mobilize our knowledge and to bring awareness to the public. And probably uh, even even more true in the case of Memorial University of Newfoundland and Labrador, where it is in our funding letters that you know, we have a duty to, to the people uh, of the province. In a sense, what you're talking about is the relevance of research, right? So how? A hundred percent. It is, and it's making our research relevant. We don't just do work to sit in an ivory tower. We're doing work to impact change. And if you're not willing to go that next step to actualize the outcomes, then what is in, in the end of the day, like, what is the point, right? We want to see uh, growth. I'd like to bring you on another, on an, another path. What I, I'd like to know if, um, whether becoming and, and, you know, no matter when this and how this happened, but in, in becoming a public scholar, what impact did it have on your work? You know, does it have some kind of retro action where you go out there? Uh, talk to the public, make your, you know, play that role of public servant, as you, as you put it, Rosemary, and were there any uh, impact on the work you do on your research, on your, on your teaching? So any, any impact of your um, practice or, or state of public scholar in your, in your academic work? Uh, John, anything to say about that? Yeah, maybe I could bridge those two, the first question and the second one, if you don't mind, um, and not take too much time with it. Um, <clears throat> as I said in, in my brief introduction, folklorists work in community, um, and we have a long history of generally attempting to work with, um, you know, underrepresented peoples and voices. Um, a fancy word is subaltern, some people use, but... Um, but I think really what we've, our, our perspective has often been that we want to work with people and empower people to, um, to work with us to express their everyday life and culture. And part of that has always had a pragmatic and practical um, element to it that some folklorists and some schools of folklore have engaged more than others. And so living in community becomes very, um, uh, it becomes an engaged practice, which is not just about disseminating our work at the end, um, but actually becoming embedded in the lives uh, of people and becoming part of these relationships over a long period of time. And some of us, um, some schools of folklore take this um, very seriously um, and, uh, and people spend years working with community. Um, and so I think that um, in disciplines which have a kind of tolerance for that and an expectation of that, then when you go out to do that kind of work, you can find a niche within your own group and people understand it and maybe you can get funding for it or maybe people under, you know, can, can appreciate that. Um, in other disciplines, I understand that that's more of an uphill battle. It's a bit of a struggle to, um, to place yourself and that kind of amount of time if your discipline values I don't know, single authored works on many of them every year. Um, so I'm lucky enough to um, come out of a scholarly tradition which, um, which understands that practice um, and which supports that kind of practice. And I've been very fortunate in, um, in having some very, in all my different years of working in communities, having some very generous people agree to work with me and put up with me over the years. So um, it is a reciprocal um, and engaged relationship and it's not always easy, um, but it is generally rewarding. So that's my way of trying to bridge those two questions. Thank you. Thanks for this, John. And I guess you make us realize that the support of the institution is 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 important, right? It's 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 certainly key to um, uh, others want to comment on the extent to which their practice as a public scholar had an impact uh on you know on their 
research or or teaching or did it did it change you in some ways rod yeah <clears throat> i can jump in there because it's it's been very obvious for me and colleagues um you know we we are in silos in research and even within the university you know many people don't know what other people are doing right even within departments <laughs> sometimes faculties you don't know exactly what somebody is studying even though you may have been in meetings with them for years so in my case for example you know, we've been here studying viruses for years in immunology, and I think because I was in the the news a little bit, and and because I was engaging the public, other people who didn't know what we were doing found out what we were doing and heard about the work we were doing. So, for example, you know, we got we had one project where we got funded by the federal government to study immune responses against or like in people who had been infected with COVID that quickly evolved into studying immune responses in people who had been vaccinated. And then we got a second project in collaboration with uh, Dr. Melanie Seal and Dr. Jacqueline Costello, myself and Michael Grant. We, um, we got funded to do a project now looking at vaccine responses in cancer patients, people who've recovered from cancer. So that collaboration came because the cancer doctors I think knew what we were doing because they had seen us in the media, because they had seen us in social media and and various places of media and sort of said, they literally said, hey, aren't you guys doing some work on the vaccines? We should test to see if our cancer patients are responding to the vaccines. And that that's turned into a very interesting collaboration that's just about to start. Very good example. Sobia, anything to say about that? I think uh, any time you are involved with um, community in or the public in any way, I think that does change you. I think that's a general for for me. That's true. I mean, I I would definitely say that um, my engagement with the community has changed how I view uh, my teaching and learning practices, um, how I um, engage, what questions I ask. Um, of my scholarship or what what I want to want to do those want to do in the world, but I think at a very fundamental level, I think in one way um, working with um, you know community um, communities that are oppressed has really changed um, has really made me more reflexive about my own practice, um, both in in teaching and in research. Um, and of course, how I engage, how I interact with communities. I think there's a real, I think we're at a time where there's a lot of um, crisis of trust um, towards all institutions. I mean, whether it's a, the abolish movements or the, you know, the defund movements, and and it's going across many many of our our, our areas. Like, you know, really some of the, um, you know, people are asking tough questions of of uh, the university, for example, and so, you know, I, in some some ways, how I enter into community, there's a lot of question mark. Is this person going to stay in 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 the community? Are you just going to extract information? Are you like so? There's this kind of there's kind of this bridge of trust that needs that that really has affected how I look at the world. So that's. You know, and again, it, it, it would have happened if I was was in the university or not, but I think uh, the the responsibility and accountability is slightly different. And I really appreciate what Rosemary said about you know us serving the public. I think that is that really has um, brought for me to light how some of the university processes really don't serve the community. And so it doesn't mean none of them do, and it doesn't mean that there isn't possibility. And that's where I work is the tension between possibility and limits. Um, and I think that that does happen um, both moving forward and being um, being critical and self-reflexive in a self-reflexive way. Thanks for this, Sobia. So I guess what hearing you, you know, make us realize the importance of uh, being ready to be changed, right? To sort of, and that's, that's interesting and and there's some we need to be humble in a sense to 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 do that uh you know as well I, I would say that pretty bluntly being out there in the media in the public sphere might bring students to us you know sometimes something students who register at our university something that we uh 
maybe are not too worried about because we're the only university in the province, but certainly for, for other universities, this is something that counts. So certainly being out there can, can help our uh, university to be successful. I want to bring you on the, what I would call the dark side of public scholarship. Um, so my own practice as a public scholar started when I was a faculty member at Concordia University in Montreal. We were chatting about this before the panel starts. So Rod indicated that he did his PhD at McGill. I was at Concordia. McGill was the enemy. So what did we do? The John Mawson School of Business? Well, we decided that we would be out there in the media. And it's really interesting now how Concordia uh, is closely connected to this piece of the city it's, it occupies. And it's called Quartier Concordia, very vibrant and, and the deep connection with, uh, with the world out there uh, at all time. Um, so when I started there as a junior faculty, I had a colleague who was also a junior faculty, extremely articulate. So this was a marketing professor. He was in the media out there all the time. He was great. You know, I was uh, opening radio and I would uh, hear him talk, turning on the radio and, and hear him talk really made me proud of my institution. But, you know, that brought him um, into trouble, you know, some people being jealous, some people, um, you know, assuming that, oh, if he's out there being able to talk to the public about his research, certainly his research is not all that serious, right? Um, I myself, you know, uh, was host, was uh, uh, doing a radio chronicle every week at Radio Canada in Montreal, and I remember um, meeting a colleague with a, from another university who said, "Well, this radio chronicle that you do every week, you know, isn't that a waste of time?" You know, so there's a bit, there's a bit of that. So how do we go about that? Have you ever experienced a sort of, you know, negative? And and let's say this is a safe space. Uh, up to a certain limit. So if you want to share with us some of your uh, some of your experience, you know, when being a public scholar wasn't something, you know, at some point you might not have feel comfortable with it in certain situations. So any sort of dark, dark side to, to share. Rosemary, I see you nod. So being a public scholar, it's complicated. Knowledge mobilization is inherent to everything we do. It's part of our grant applications. It's expected of us. But what we never talk about is how people don't always want us to mobilize the knowledge we produce. Not everyone wants to hear our outcomes and findings, particularly when they are rather negative. And I myself have never received death threats, but I, as a person, have received, I, I've received many people who don't feel I do enough. So it, it doesn't matter how much I'm doing, they still feel because I'm not responding to their immediate need that I'm not doing enough in the public sphere and to bring recognition. And it can be difficult. And I know that I have colleagues who have received death threats. I've experienced a lot of that being on the COVID task force with RSC. And it's one of those very prominent realities that we need to deal with. But a lot of it stems from the fact when we produce knowledge, we're guided by the evidence. And the evidence is not necessarily what is being suggested or hoped for by the organizations to which we are to mobilize knowledge to make impacts. And, and that's something that we never talk about. And it's something that we really need to start talking about. What is a knowledge mobilization plan or a knowledge translation plan to an audience who are quite content with their current practices? Just because we want to do it, it doesn't, um, it doesn't actually put forward that it's a welcomed reality. So, and it's quite difficult and I know for myself, I've, I've often, and I'm thinking a particular example of a particular correctional officer who doesn't feel I do enough and it doesn't matter how much I do. Um, it, it feels, it, it's disconcerting, it's difficult, it's troubling because you want to actually make that impact and positively impact everyone, but it's also we don't we don't have control over how we're received by people and how we're interpreted despite our best intentions and it is a challenge that comes with with this occupation thanks rosemary anybody else on the dark side if i may of public uh, public uh, scholarship john do you have something to share on that i just wanted to echo uh, those uh, those comments um you know we use words like community and public as if they were some sort of block of people um and that's just silly um, anybody who's dipped their toe into um, into COVID uh, and COVID nineteen um, public engagement, which um, which I've done with uh, with the book on uh, conspiracy theories that myself and co-authors um, just finished, um, you realize that um, even if you're working, you know, 
with a group of people, there's there's all these currents and contest uh, contests and power struggles and everything like that. There's there is no kind of static place that you stand when you work in the public field and when you work closely with community. And to suggest that that was ever going to be easy would be naive and silly. And I think if there's any grad students out there watching, no, you will never be on solid ground. Stop giving. <laughs> Don't. That's just not going to happen. And so I think one of the challenges that we face is that when you're when you're there, um, that's where you are, and the environment is is difficult and shifting and contested, and you're just there, um, along with a lot of other people trying to puzzle your way through it. You do it with integrity, um, and you try to do it with the skills that you have, but it's always going to be difficult, and you're not going to have good days. And I think that's fair enough to say. I hope that's fair enough to say. Very, very interesting, John. So, yeah, it, and I like what you say that we're not talking to a block of people that all think alike. Uh, maybe this means that one needs to have tough skin to be a, a public scholar, right? I guess we do have tough, tough skin, tough skin when we send paper out to be reviewed and they, you know, are rejected and nobody understands what we're trying to say. But it's maybe even worse when we're out there in the public sphere. I remember once participating about 10 years ago, participating in a um, talk show, you know, like 1 million viewer on uh, Radio Canada on television on a Sunday evening. I was there to defend the fact that the Canadian government uh, should, you know, invest and should continue to invest money in the aerospace uh, industry. You should have seen my Twitter feed that evening, you know, like people thought I was like on drugs or so. Yes, you need, you need to be, uh, I guess you need to be tough, right? So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not always easy to put yourself out there. Anybody else on this dark side of, of scholarship, Rod? Yeah, first of all, I'd say it's been mostly positive. Um, I've. You know, it's something I never thought I would get the chance to do at this level, but, um, you know, you do get a lot of positive feedback, right? And, you know, it's a particular case. We're in a pandemic and hopefully we're not going to see those too often. But, you know, when people tell you they've heard what you've said and they appreciate it, it's, it's really nice. You feel, you know, you feel nervous and stressed when you do these things and you, you never know how you sounded. So it's good to get positive feedback, but there's some negative for sure. Um, it's and it's at many levels little things like oh you must be loving the attention you know when somebody when a colleague says that to you it hurts because <clears throat> it's nice to be recognized i'll admit of course but you know it it hurts a little when people say oh you must love the attention because they don't realize you're getting hate mail on a regular basis they don't realize that as soon as you finish your live interview you look at your twitter to see what nasty things are going to be said about you. And some of these emails are really hard to, to deal with and very discouraging. And you just have to ignore them, unfortunately. But people don't see that part, right? They see you smile. They see you say thank you for the opportunity. And they don't realize how much stress you're feeling when you're going through it. Um, and then the, in the bigger picture, and I don't think I've experienced this yet, but I have talked to colleagues. You know, my, my PhD supervisor was always in the news about HIV years ago. And I know that sometimes his he was perceived as an attention seeker who loved to be on the news more than doing science. And I believe that impacted the way his science was evaluated. When he submitted a research proposal, I think some people thought, oh, he's, he's a media guy. He's not a scientist. He's just looking for attention. And, and there's maybe some jealousy, some animosity. And sometimes the work, you know, the research may have been evaluated negatively because people had a personal feeling toward him because he was in the media so much. And I don't think, you know, now I think funding agencies, and we should definitely address a comment from Karen Stanbridge because she she hit right on this. Um, you know, the idea that funding agencies expect us to do these things now, um, but it can come back negatively on you. So that's part of the barrier to get people to do it because they know it can come back negatively. Thanks, Thanks. Rodin. Yes, I know we have fantastic question coming in in the chats. I think we'll turn to the Q and A maybe earlier than we thought. I'm just not good at reading the chat. Hey, and Isabel, uh, I'm happy to read it. And I actually just checked in with Karen, and I know that she actually has to leave the session early. So probably okay. would be great if we could address it ahead of the Q and A. I'll just you ask it. it. And I did see there's actually a follow up as well. So the question is, uh, hello, most of you describe falling into public engagement slash uh, scholarship as an outgrowth of your research. 
What do you think about the requirement that scholars engage in public scholarship by granting agencies, hiring, and P and T committees? And I noted that uh, Walter Okshevsky uh, kind of followed up and said, "Good question. Could academic freedom serve to diffuse this requirement?" Very good question. Yeah, I was going to certainly turn on the PNT process in, in the discussion because it, it really is important. So somebody wants to jump in on that about requirement uh, to be out there. Anybody wants to jump in? Rod? I think Sabia was about to say, so maybe I'll let her, let her oh, Okay, first. sorry. I mean, I, I, I mean on, a, on a very basic level, I think that any requirement, um, whether that's to do or not to do public um, scholarship of any sort is is troubling, and I mean I think I think really acad academic um, and you know pursuits really um, they need, I mean I think there's the issue of dissemination and relevance to to community, but I don't think that in in my opinion that any even though it, that any expectation um be put on research and scholarship because you don't know i think that this idea about happenstance and public engagement also happens in in research and theoretical conversations and very minute you know especially in the sciences or even in in the social sciences and in the arts i think that that really that's my short answer um and i think the I do want to go back to the or the other question if that's okay but i or I can do that later after because i know that karen has to leave Please go ahead. Um, yeah, I think that um, there's the, the 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 public the harm of doing public scholarship is you know I've been following a lot of um, uh, women and racialized public scholars, and I think it's beyond tough skin and hate mail. I see I'm watching how certain people are um, are actually harassed much more on things like Twitter or in social media, other forms of social media. And I think that that idea that it's, that it's, you know, like, you know, you know, uh, the project that I've worked on, worked on, it's been a tipped many times um, with the same questions being asked over and over again, um, you know, and I mean, things like that. I've received personal death threats, Islamophobic, um, you know, uh, I guess disregarding my own beliefs in humanity or assuming my beliefs in humanity. I mean, I think those are those are one real risk of public engagement. And the other the other piece um, is the minimization of how much work and I think work that is required in engaging the community. I think John actually you talked a little bit about the shifting. There's this idea that the work that you do in relation to community is 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 a theoretical you know a um a intellectual as that word but i just made it up but i mean i think i think that there is this idea that that the work that you do in relation to community in relation to the public requires you know nothing more than just you know, I don't know. I don't know what people think, but I, I know that it's when I see people who are engaged in community and when I see people who are engaged in the media, I know how much work and preparation require is required to, you know, to be there. And I think it is minimized in, in academic um, uh, environments. It's seen as a line on your resume, on your CV and, and, and the way that P and T and, and I'm glad that that, it, you know, relates to P &T, how P and T looks at it. Or how um, you know your your grants are adjudicated are like one line, but that one line requires uh, you know immense amount of um, intellectual and emotional um, and embodied presence that um, I think it's really disregarded in the academic uh, world and also on the flip side in the public world. Thanks so much for that, Sobia. And you know, of course, racism and all that puts all this difficulty to it. It puts things to that uh, even more complicated level. So thank, thanks for sharing this. Um, let's jump into the onto the PNT uh, question because in our audience this morning we probably have both assistant 
and associate and full professor, right? So there's this line in your academic life, you know, like it's so terrorizing the year up to tenure and then eventually it's complete freedom, right? After tenure to some extent. Uh, I'll give you an example of, so what we're doing uh, right now in the faculty of, of, of business administration, we have an, we had an ad out there. We're recruiting for a position and how we've positioned this is that we want a new faculty member from any of our business disciplines. As long as that person can support what we refer to the uh, technology ecosystem in the province, right? Technology, uh, that's an important uh, um, industry in our province and we want a new faculty member that will be able to you know, reach out to, uh, to this community, trade organization, companies and so on. Uh, we were discussing this and one uh, member of the hiring committee mentioned, yeah, but what about PNT? You know, we're asking that person to come in and to do all these things, to do the, you know, publish and all that, plus do that. How will they manage that? And I was almost sad when I heard that comment because it was a bit as if, oh, the PNT is like this thing from outer space, you know, and, and they come to us and they, we are the PNT, right? It's up to us what it is that we, that we consider as, as, you know, relevant. And so I'd like to hear you about that, about, you know, do you think it's a, something feasible before t tenure? How do we, there's a question here about how could the university uh, support uh, those who are in the public eye? You know, well, does it, does it, does it start there, you know, supporting junior faculty who are engaged in, a, in, in the public sphere in that, in that way? Or am I dreaming? What do you think, guys? Anybody wants to jump in? John? I'll start off with just uh, because I think there's also a bridge here between um, the earlier chat question. Um, because what um, you know, what administration and PT want public engagement to be is not necessarily what public engagement could or should be. So I think that that ground is also contested. Um, and I certainly wouldn't, although on a panel about public engagement, I certainly wouldn't give up on my own kind of naive um, view of the university as a separate sort of project, as a thing unto itself, which is not necessarily reducible to, you know, administration's needs and desires or whatever flavor of the month is going around that they want us to engage in. And I think that that even P&T can get involved in these kinds of things um, and can find certain kinds of focuses. So I don't have a I don't have a solution to your um, uh, to your question about PNT, except that the composition of PNT becomes very very important, and I would just open it up to my wiser colleagues to talk about that. Thanks, John. Uh, Rosemary, I think this is a, a place to kind of highlight a really important tension, right? Because you have the tension and that push for public engagement, and you know what's required for PNT is determined by your department that you're in and your faculty and everything else. But you have this tension where the push to do things and to be in the public eye could create pressures to speak on things that maybe you're kind of outside your expertise and can put you in a position that is very, very compromising. And I think that is something we really need to look at as we talked about, everything over time will have its point. And when, when things go into the public eye is not dependent on your own um, promotional purview or journey, right? Instead, it's very dependent. And I think one of the things we have to really pay attention to when we talk about public engagement, for all reasons, it's really important to stay within our wheelhouse, like where you get into trouble. And it's okay in public, and, and this is kind of in response to other questions that are being posed, it's okay to act, and I say it all the time that I actually don't know the answers and cannot comment on certain things because I can't. And I'm not going to put myself in a position where I'm compromising my own academic integrity to be able to actually make comments. And I wouldn't do that for promotion and tenure or anything else. But I think there's a tension there and an undue pressure that people may spend time doing public engagement because they feel it's obligatory. And, and I think that's something really important to recognize. So. Public engagement is not necessarily something that should come with pressures. It should be timely and based on research and knowledge and growth and, and a way to serve the public. And, and public engagement, you know, maybe linking back to some of, of Sobia's earlier comments, 
we're talking as if public engagement only meant like being out there in the media and social media. Public engagement can be something that is much less visible, right? Uh, I'll give you the example of we have a, a Canada research chair in social entrepreneurship in our faculty. Uh, this is somebody who joined a, a, a memorial four years ago, literally fell in love with Newfoundland and is literally kind of living next to the field that he studies. You know, he's like embedded in. And it's not somebody who is out there in the media all the time, not at all. But there's just this very, very close connection with his, you know, concrete research object all the time. That too is, is public engagement, right? It's not just being out there in the public eye, but I think, uh, Rosemary, you really say something important about venturing out of your field of expertise can certainly be uh, the um, dangerous. Rod, please go ahead. Yeah, I would just add to that because, um, you know, the collective agreement in many ways tries to normalize all of us, to equalize all of us and to give us opportunity, but also to have you know, equality in assessment, right? But that's, in a way, that's not practical because as was already pointed out, right? Every every department, every faculty has a different definition of, you know, what they need or expect. And the problem I see with that is, well, with the collective agreement, I mean, is that, you know, it's research and teaching. And research now, thankfully, has evolved into scholarly activity. So, in, you know, before it used to be research or teaching, and that was it. That was what you get promoted on. You know, service was there, but it wasn't really a, an equal criteria. Public engagement now, I think, is for most um, for most faculties is wrapped into the scholarly activity, um, unless you're teaching in, in, in that way. But uh, I think it, it comes down to the faculties to really interpret the public engagement piece and say, you know, and add value to it, because I don't think the person, I don't think the collective agreement puts enough value on public engagement. Uh, but I know different faculties in different departments, you know, have that as a priority. So perhaps I hope people get more credit in different uh, faculties and departments as, as I think they should. But I think there's a disconnect between the collective agreement and and what different departments and faculties believe is success for their faculty members. Yeah, that's an interesting comment. It's a tough question, isn't it? Like you don't want to over define everything. Yes, you want to leave it to to academic units, but at the same time, what does this mean? You know, to guarantee that what whatever work somebody does in the public eye, that people don't get don't get punished uh, by it. Uh, I'm going to turn into the chat because there's a really interesting question from Diana uh, De Carvalho about. Um, the advice, any advice that you could give in order to, in regards to controlling the message and, you know, make sure it, that's actually an interesting question, right? We're all trained to write scholarly papers and we have, you know, reviewers telling us how we should do that. We're really trained to do that. We might not necessarily be trained to, you know, talk to the public that way. And sometimes, you know, uh, this is, might this might lead people to venture out of their expertise as as rosemary was was mentioning so any uh, any advice on on how we how we control the message if it's if it's possible at all anybody wants to jump in rosemary i think one of the things we have to accept is we don't have control over the message um i i hate saying it because it sounds very but we, we don't have control over how we're interpreted. Um, we can be best intentions, and if people decide that they wanna take us a particular way, they're gonna take it a particular way and find a way to justify that. We will also be edited. We will also be like, I prefer doing when I'm doing public talks, and I'm not a social media public engagement person. I do it through media and other platforms. Um, I prefer to be able to be live where there isn't the ability to edit. And when I have not been live and I've been edited, there are times where it just makes me cringe because that wasn't the sentence, right? So I, I do think when you're going out there, you look at the public good and what that means and what message you wanna get out there and make sure it's worth it because you don't have control. I don't know if I've ever done it. Uh, Rod. Yeah, just a very quick big echo on that one. Um, after doing many recorded Zoom and phone calls, 
you <clears throat> you really have no control over what gets played later. And I recently said to to my partner, you know, I'm only doing live from now on because even then, you know, you can get a question that you you know is not the most important thing that needs to get out there. And you can you can you know, once you get used to it, you can pivot from one question to the message that you need think needs to get out there at that moment, the most important thing that's on people's minds at the moment. But once with the you know with the recorded virtual interviews and the you know phone mess phone interviews you have no idea what they're going to actually play later and sometimes it's really not the, the what you wanted to get out yeah it can be very frustrating to do a you know 15 minutes interview and they keep like 10 seconds and really not your your best self so yeah uh john go ahead this isn't the work that i do but i just like to point out that there's um some um some public um folklores and research groups in the states that do really amazing communication work. Um, so when they're, they do embedded um, scholarship, I'm thinking about a crowd down in Connecticut and they work with um, marginalized communities. And when they're done their research project, they produce five different reports. Um, the first report is like a scholarly report and then they have a media report. And then, and each one is gauged specifically to the, com the different communities that they're aiming to reach. And one of the most important ones is a report to the people who helped in the research. So these marginalized communities and whatever kind of media that they consume in and how they consume in specific language and all the rest of that. So, so I think it's, it's not quite as simple as, you know, how to do a good radio interview. I mean, if you really go hardcore into public engagement, what you're looking at is in a complete communication strategy. Um, and again, I'm kind of talking about other people that inspire me, not the work that I do. Um, but uh, but I think that that's a, a beautiful model that this one group that I've seen uses. And John, that's very interesting, actually, these different level of, of communication of the results to different audience and, and in the end giving back, right, to, to those who participated in the research. All that written by the same by the researchers themselves or because you know there could be sometimes institutional help into turning something that is more scholarly and something that is more digestible for for the communities yeah at this point i think this is a relevant moment i would like to go back to the question from erica mishrad about what the university can do to support public scholarship and i also see that there's a comment from veronique forbes you just mentioned the communications aspect, Isabel, which I think is, is interesting and useful. Let's also add this to the mix. Uh, Veronique says, smaller teaching loads would help a lot. We have a five course a year teaching load at HSS, four courses during your first two years. There's very little flexibility for junior faculty in such circumstances. It can be very hard to do all the things we're supposed to do in a high standard already. So doing public engagement on top is very hard. And then in brackets, she says, if we think mental health, work-life balance. Just my two cents, thanks to all the panelists. So before you guys, before, before you guys answer, I have a little story and it will make Veronique smile. So uh, as you know, I'm francophone, so I religiously listen every Sunday. There's a radio show called Les Années Lumière, right? Which is about, uh, which is about science. And Veronique was actually there last Sunday talking about her work in archaeology and the uh, paper that her and her team have, have published in Nature. I was sitting at home so proud, you know, so I wrote a little line to Veronique telling her, you know, great job. And, you know, I'm with you with the, the, the course load is certainly something that uh, that was actually Veronique, my, my initial question when, when we brought the PNT in the the notion of time, right? Uh, one of my colleagues used to refer to this as, you know, can we all be Hollywood professors, you know, where we're fantastic in class, we teach five courses, we publish like hell in all the top tier journals and write books. And at the same time, we, you know, are in the media uh, every time and we tweet all the time. At some point, you know, time, uh, unless you're able to sleep two, three hours. So, yeah. So anybody wants to jump in and, uh, and comment on, um, on Veronique's uh, questions? How can we do all these things, Sobia? You you can't. <laughs> like I think that's that's all there is to it, and I think you know it relate it relates back to the question about the PNT and and all you know those conversations. I I think that there needs to be a serious conversation at 
all levels um, of the university, um, starting from, you know, units themselves, faculties or departments themselves about what is realistic. And, and I think it really does it. I think you cannot do all at all at the same time. And, and I think that the, the problem with, uh, with expecting to do all at the same time, you also don't know who's going to be evaluating your work all the time, you know, until you get to that year, perhaps. Um, you don't know, um, you know, whether that be grants adjudicated or not, it's not just promotion and tenure, but it's also all, all other things. You can't do everything. And I think that's why I think really, you know, having those real, um, you know, understanding and conversations within your units to and across disciplines even to understand what's valuable um, is really important. And I and I think you can't I think you can't do it all. Um, it really is dependent on what time in your career you are in, uh, what um, what luck or bad luck happens to you. Um, I, you know these 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 things really they're just they are impossible. But that doesn't mean that that public scholarship doesn't have its rewards. It doesn't mean that publishing in top tier journals doesn't have its rewards. Um, you know, I think that disseminate. We have to understand. You know, the that that you know our our scholarship is for is a public good, and so how we mobilize that, um, yeah, is really a matter of choice depending on you know both your strengths and. Um, you know, structural constraints or things that can facilitate that. Thanks, Sylvia. Anybody else on this so important work life balance? John? Uh, anybody who's seen my CV knows I don't do it all. Um, in fact, embarrassingly so at times. Um, but, uh, but one of the things that um, that I think is often underappreciated, maybe by PT and admin, that I didn't want to, to let go here is that the work that really talented public engaged scholars do um, in the end isn't just for them, it's for the next generation and cohort that follow them. I'm really inspired by the work of a recently retired colleague of mine out here, Dr. Ivan Emke, who put a lot of work into communities up and down the West Coast. Um, and I know probably got a lot of snide comments from colleagues um, or from uh, town. And um, and he, if you do your work well, people are happy to see the next cohort show up. People are happy to share relationships and to build and maintain relationships. And so this is hard to put into P and T. Um, but when you get to um, perhaps, I suppose, a certain um, stage of your own career, um, if you can get there with half your brain intact, you'll realize that the scholars that came before you and that did this kind of work have helped you. And so I don't know where you can codify that. I just wanted to not let that pass by um, and to and to recognize it. Thanks, John. Anybody else on the work life balance? I guess I guess what we're doing to just you know having this very panel today, and uh, you know we have quite a bit of people in in attendance. In a sense, we're all you know socially constructing maybe this university of tomorrow where where public uh, scholarship will be will be part of our dna uh, it, it, it's not an easy question the work life balance but in my in my role of of dean what i see is that um, people tend to be way tougher on themselves than any pnt will be you know like i see how junior faculty are are driven you know they they all come out uh, of PhD programs where they've been, you know, trained to try to do, uh, you know, I, they set for themselves objectives that I find sometimes uh, not that I that that it's not a question of of asking them to do less. No, it's asking them not to be too too tough on on themselves, certainly, and trying not to see, I guess, this public scholarship. Um, adventure as, you know, another task to do, right? It's It should be seen as simply another angle of our work. Rod? Yeah, if I can just um, <clears throat> spin it around for a second, because I like that Sylvia, Sylvia ended off on a positive note. You know, I think I think there's, there's really a lot of benefit in it. And one thing I've realized is that the university loves anything that makes the university look good. 
And, you know, um, one thing I've learned throughout through this pandemic is that, you know, um, there's so much knowledge here at the university about everything, not just pandemic viruses, but, you know, I think we're all shy. I think <laughs> we're all more shy than we really want to admit. And I think, you know, if we can encourage people to, to get out there or, you know, find some media, you know, whether it's let's talk science, going to schools to talk to children or, or whatever your topic is. But I think, you know, I know the work life balance is hard and then finding time to do extra stuff is hard, but the, you know, the positive, I, I feel there's a lot of positive here and not just making the university look good. You know, when you, when you, when the people, when the public realizes what you're doing and, and know what you're doing and, you know, I think it encourages attendance at the university. I think it encourages investment. It encourages, you know, people to donate to the university for um, whatever relief programs like we had for graduate students in the past year. I mean, the philanthropy is is bigger than we realize. And I really believe that the public engagement is probably one of the biggest drivers behind, you know, the the public wanting to collaborate and help the university. So I. I see a lot of positive and, you know, if you, if you get talking P and T, you're always going to have a negative conversation, unfortunately. But, uh, I, you know, I think, I think the positive stuff is, is underestimated. That's a good point, Rod. Anybody else on that? Um, good, some good questions, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the chat. So Erica is asking, uh, how, how much of what we're discussing about PNT collective agreement, teaching loan could be mitigated by policy or advocacy. Uh, yes, for sure. It's something we're, we're talking about all the time. I guess I want to talk just a little bit about, um, business schools, right? So business schools were funded about a hundred years ago. They started to exist and they were invented to create a class of managers that would be socially responsible, believe it or not a hundred years ago. And it's interesting how business school, um, started to integrate universities and around the 50s, 40, 50, 60, they started to feel really shy, you know, and they feel that, oh, we don't deserve to be here, you know, as a, as a scholarly faculty, we're, we're just perceived as a, as a trade school. So there was a shift in business schools um, where people engage in research, like, you know, big time and, and really, really focusing on only scholarly work, you know, up to the point where there's there's a bit of a, there's been a bit of a criticism about some uh, thinkers and scholars that business schools might have have lost their ways and they're very disconnected from business practice. Uh, not many uh, practitioners will actually read articles that are published in scholarly uh, business journals, and and that is that. That is a, a problem that is more and more recognized. Um, bodies that accredited business schools, so one is called the uh, AAC, is B Association, Association to Advance College of Business and uh, Colleges, Schools of Business, is really now pushing for impact. And I'm talking to you about that because we're going to be reviewed in about two weeks, right? And what we needed to demonstrate really is the impact of our work. So it's not only like how many papers and how many, how many times they were uh, cited and all that. It's what's the impact? What's the impact on practitioners? How do you know? What's the impact on teaching? What's the impact on society? So there's a bit of, of, of hope, I would say, uh, when we see something that like that, this push to make, uh, to make our work, uh, um, you know, more, more in impactful in a, in a concrete way. So I guess that's one way there's, there, there seems to be that like an institutionalization process from outside the business school, business who's pushing pushing them in that direction and, and and what we're doing this morning talking about this and talking about all the positive outcome of public engagement is totally in line with what uh, with what modern business schools uh, should do um anything that um you would wish you would have known before uh, engaging in this type of of public work errors that you did or you know if you, if you had to do it again would you do things a bit differently we talked about uh you know a uh, live interview as opposed to recorded ones so you know to make sure that we control the message a bit although rosemary was clear into telling us that well we cannot control anything so any any advice anything that you would uh, 
that you would say to uh, to um, our attendees, to the public about, you know, things that you would have liked to know, you know, beforehand or things that you would do differently? Anybody has an example? John? Sometimes your expertise doesn't count for a hill of beans. I think that's pretty important, um, especially if you're working on and with community on projects that they're interested in and that uh, that you are also interested in that reciprocal thing. Um, I've tried to help um, uh, some museums and some um, some community based researchers design something like, say, an oral history project. Um, they didn't want to do it my way. It wasn't my project. I was like, oh, I'm sort of kind of an ex. Shut up. <laughs> Give me some information and get out of the way. Um, and I think that that initially, especially when I was um, a bunch of years ago, I, that bugged me a lot. Um, and that was a silly thing for me to take on to be pestered by. Um, and so I think, um, I think while I know that we want to sort of stay within our expertise, I think we should also recognize that how the community defines what we're experts in can also affect uh, what we do and how we do it. And I think the, a level of humility is certainly important um, and, uh, and, um, and friendship and sharing is important in that sense as well. That's fascinating. Thanks, John. Anybody else on that advice, things that you would have liked to know before, uh, before starting to be in the public eye? Um, one of the things I would say is you don't always have a choice. You don't necessarily choose to be in the public eye or not be in the public eye. And the only thing, and I said it before, it's stay within the realm of your expertise, however we define our expertise, right? Um, but it, it don't don't stray and don't don't let yourself be positioned in such a way where you feel you need to make a comment just because I, a recent example, I was doing a podcast and they really wanted my opinion on some helicopters they've used in, in, in Winnipeg for policing. And I know nothing about this, so I was not going to comment. And I was kind of pushed into a corner and I was like, that's great. Why don't you tell me what you think? But I don't know about it. And and don't let someone manipulate you into giving an answer when you're not comfortable. And I think that's really, really important because that's where that's where you'll get yourself into trouble. So just just stick to what you know, and it's okay to not know things. We don't know everything, and it's okay to to be in that place. So really a level of, we need to be able to be humble, right? It's uh, and, and outside of our comfort zone in, in the sense of recognizing what are the things we can comment on and, and other, other things we cannot comment on. Anybody else who would like to give advice to our uh, participant about, you know, things you would have liked to know before you started, Rod? Just to circle back to what Sylvia said earlier that it, you spend much more time on these things than, than, than the actual minutes you're on the screen or you know on the radio. So the work-life balance it can impact you know your life, right? When you there was a, a Saturday morning where I was stressed because I had a, a live interview, uh, you know, at at, at ten o'clock on a Saturday morning, and we have five and three year old little girls. So you know to find a quiet place on a Saturday morning in the house, you know that meant you know asking my wife to take the children to you know somewhere else in the house and giving me privacy and on us you know i we did that one morning and it caused a lot of stress and that that was it we, we agreed it wasn't going to happen again you know i can talk all day in my office on a wednesday but saturday morning you can't shut down your house because of a five minute interview and, and expect your children to, to you know to be quiet when they they haven't seen you all week you know much you know just evenings so i think the you know, making sure that you don't try to do every interview whenever they want you, you know, it, you have to really be selective and do what you can do and, and not let it impact your, your family life. Thanks for sharing this, Rod. Although COVID has made us be, uh, you know, we like to see children and, and, and dogs and everybody jumping on the screen, whenever, whenever everybody, talks. but it's a good point, you know, like setting boundaries and yes, you don't have to do, to do everything. Um, so there's an entry. Uh, go ahead, Sylvia. Yeah, I, I think I, I'd like to talk to Rod about how he does that balance thing because I actually am very terrible at it. Um, I think one of the things that I wish that I had I known was that I wasn't alone in this. And I think one of the questions was about what strategies around, uh, can, you know, making things accessible, having you know 
folks, you know, we don't have a lot of education and um, at the university about how to do media, how to do, how to control the message or how to actually have talking points. And that comes from, from me, from the, the learning has come from me from within social movements. And I think that that is really important, but I think that having folks, you're not doing it alone. And one of the things that we're doing in a couple of the projects that, that I'm working on with community is we're really doing this together. So, so we, we, prep ourselves for any presentation together. There's three or four people who join us and you don't have to. And, and it's for, for that project, it's engaging the community in a different way, a specific community relying on them because some of them are smarter than me in terms of that's a word that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Exacerbate is not a good word. Like I've been told off so many times about having, you know, what I think is a regular language, but they say it's academic language and it's not understandable. Um, and, and I'm not shying away from academic knowledge or, or, or things, but I think that there is having a team of folks within your departments, within your family and friend and community um, places that you're not doing all this work alone. So that could be one way where institution can support uh, public scholars, right? So. Mm -hmm. Thanks for this. Um, so lots of questions in the chat. And before we turn and, and, and give the voice to, to our uh, to the, the, the public today, I'm instructed by Rebecca to tell everyone that there's going to be an event survey shared in shared in the chat. So make sure make sure you uh, you complete that. Um, I want to turn to a question and see. I seem to be able to both read and uh, and host the panel. Um, well, I can't help her much, um, but uh, but I would just say that um, that that there's there's actually some really neat literature in ethnographic methodologies about positionality um, and intersectionality that can help you puzzle your way through certain things. And the truth is, it's a question of choices. Um, you can't be a blank slate and be engaged. You just can't. Um, and you're always going to find yourself negotiating these positions. Um, now, the grace and the skill with which you do it can be improved, I suppose. Um, but, but we can't deny that that we're we're in a tangled web, um, and that's just where we are. Um, I don't know if that helped. I'm sorry. Anybody else? I can speak to that. I mean, there's definitely some of the work that I've done has 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 um, affected what access I have to um, to government, as an example, um, uh, to to um, to nonprofit organizations, which is which is some of my research. And I think again, I think that uh, John, your point is really important here because you know it is about choices and and. And yes, you can be muzzled. Yes, you can be denied research opportunities uh, with some of this work. And um, and I think, you know, I've chosen for for me what I've chosen is to be on the side of community um, to social movements that I am part of that that you know link to community. And so you know, my focus has changed from you know, um, and engaging in a certain type of policy change or policy advocacy to a different form of policy advocacy, which is um, on the ground and, you know, and sometimes it has its fruits and sometimes it has its, it has its big costs as well. Um, and I guess one of the things is that I, I wish I had, I wish I had known earlier in my career that this was the path I was going to choose because I would have done it a lot better and a lot more sure instead of instead of you know getting into this kind of um, in you know academic bean counting um, route, you know these kind of things I think that I would have been more true to why I entered the academy at all um, and um, so it's been a painful journey but I'm really happy to be where I am. Thanks for sharing this, Sylvia. And I guess it's it it goes back to what Rosemary was saying about 
not controlling everything, right? There might be some uh, uh, impact of your work that can be detrimental to future work, but at the same time, that's, yeah, exactly. That's, that's, we have to be prepared for, for this type of risk. Uh, I would say. Uh, I'd like to turn to Walter uh, uh, Ochevsky, who uh, posted something in the chat about the philosophy for the public uh, series in the philosophy department. So could we bring on Walter if he's not too shy so he can tell us a bit more about that? Is that possible? There he is. Walter can unmute himself now if he if he wants to. Oh, there we go. We hear you, Walter. That's not possible. I haven't said anything. Oh, <laughs> sorry. That was John. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Walter. So, yes, I'm puzzled about that. Tell us more about this series. Well, in uh, uh, my I could be sure the chat section forgot to mention what is probably the most important um, aspect of the philosophy for the public series. And that is that it's held in a bar. It's held in the ship. And of course, a police escort uh, is required for all the speakers here. And uh, we have, uh, well, not only philosophy professors, but uh, really philosophy, uh, profs from various units come and speak on of, of, ex, of expertise. But in, uh, as I write, in most cases, the audience does not uh, uh, deem them to be experts or recognize their expertise and are more than willing to contradict anything that is said by the speaker who has perhaps spent about 10, 15 years uh, studying the <laughs> academic literature on the topic. Uh, this is especially uh, the case with uh, issues to do with ethics and uh, politics. Um, so I, I don't know what I don't know what the panelists want to make uh, of that, but uh, the series is always uh, quite well uh, uh, attended, and uh, the audience, who are who typically are not sim only uh, graduate and undergraduate students, but they, they come in literally off off the street, um, ha have an enjoyable time, and it's not just because of the beer and nachos. That sounds that sounds great. Thanks for thanks for sharing this. And you know, probably, I guess the audience is likely to increase even more going forward. So sounds like good fun, and it's it's a very good way, very good example to uh, of how we can you know share our work in a way that is uh, that is um, um, you know that can connect with 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 the general public. Um, any this other questions? Yeah, sorry, yeah. this is Rebecca. I just want to pop in. There is one more question we should circle back to from the chat, but I also wanted to note that now we are really in the Q&A session. And if people would like to ask a question, they can just go ahead and use the uh, the hand up uh, mechanism through the chat. Uh, but I did want to jump back. Patricia had asked uh, kind of a fun light question. Uh, with all of you being so involved in terms of being there in the media and in the public eye, do you have any funny anecdotes from those scholarly activities that you could share? And I see that Ken, Kenneth Snellgrove has raised his hand, so we can go to him for the next question. Okay, anybody has something funny to share? It's, a, it's actually a great question. Anybody has something funny? To, I'm trying to think of something while I think. Can, can anybody, anybody have some? Yes, go ahead, so yeah. Um, my 10 year old thinks I'm really famous and, um, she actually values me more as a mother than when I was just doing the motherly duty. So she's, she's often behind me in my zoom and, you know, <laughs> chatting. Um, so somebody values my work. So I appreciate. <laughs> John. Uh, my daughter is much older than yours and thinks I'm terribly embarrassing. So, yeah. Anybody else, Rod? Yeah, my kids are young, right? They're three and five, so they've, you know, they barely remember pre-pandemic. So they've seen me on TV throughout the pandemic, and now they're totally immune to it. So it's no big deal, right? You know, if they see me on TV, they don't even look at the television now. It's like, oh yeah, well, oh, well. big, no big deal, right? You're, you're on TV again. But then the kids on the street. So my neighbor's kid comes running up to me one day, and he he does this sort of side look at me and says, "You were on TV." 
I said, yeah. And he said, how'd you do that? So <laughs> there was a little bit of reward from my, my neighbor's kids. I think that, you know, one, one, one general thing is that I would say that, you know, sometimes I, you know, on some occasion I was really, really bad, <laughs> you know, like I thought I was, oh my God, this is completely ridiculous. Why am I doing this? And then I wanted to go underneath the carpet, you know, so I guess you have to uh, be able to, I, I had a friend who was actually, a, 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 she was an anchor person on the radio and her motto was, you know, well, I guess what counts is the, in French, la moyenne au bâton. So your average at the back, you know? So yeah, I guess you have to be really ready to kind of make fun of yourself. You know, you cannot take yourself too seriously because anything can, can happen. Uh, Rosemary, anything funny to share? My kids are more like Rod. I've got four of them. They range in age from 13 to six and they're kind of indifferent to it. It's more like if, if we want to see how something plays, they're like, no, we're watching TV. Like, oh, no, like it's not time for you, mom. So, yeah, so it, it's more, it's more just a kind of a normal thing. Thanks. All right. So we have Ken on screen now. So Ken, go ahead with your question. Yeah, so uh, um, uh, so I just uh, would like to. Uh, I've been professing for a while that the that the um, memorial needs a um, a, a, a university wide statement on academic freedom. I think McGill has uh, got a good model there, but really our only academic freedom uh, uh, is derived from the monthly collective agreement. And uh, that leaves out a lot of academics uh, uh, on our campuses, and uh, including all the people from the Marine Institute. Uh, uh, have, uh, well, except for some a couple of monthly members up there, uh, but um, uh, and as well for uh, academic administrators uh, uh, on campus. That uh, you know, you take great personal risks, and we heard some of that uh, here that uh, about the risks that are are taken and. And at least you've you've got some guarantee that you're uh, that if you're a monthly member that you're going to be able to keep your job. Uh, uh, but um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, you know I, I I think that the uh, that the campus is uh, is changing and we're seeing lots of uh, new things happening and uh, it uh, it it would be uh, it would be an important thing I think to recognize the uh, the freedom of all academics uh, uh, on campus and. Uh, and, and so that um, uh, so that people aren't hesitant to uh, to come out and speak about their uh, their areas and extramural speech as well uh, 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 outside of uh, the university context. Thanks. It's interesting, you know, when we when we remember why does tenure exist, right? The, the reason for tenure is not job security as we think we we, we interpret it now. That the idea behind tenure was that faculty members could feel free to say what they want right and that's that's actually a, a very important thing i think this is this is what in a sense uh, public scholarship public scholarship is about is to take position right can be very difficult we've had example that yes it can uh, hurt some relationships uh, with you know communities or groups with whom you you that you need to keep and, and relationships that are important to your research. So it's not without risk. So certainly that protection uh, uh, is, is certainly, uh, certainly important. Uh, any other questions from the chat, Rebecca? I think we're coming close to the, uh, yes, go ahead, John. I think too, um, when we speak about academic freedom and expertise, um, we should recognize that academic freedom is also there to protect us when we're wrong. Because we seem to be positioning ourselves as, oh, we're experts wandering out into the great barren wastelands of ignorance, and we are right. We are wrong. I mean, our profession is based upon us being wrong sometimes and being partially right and getting better at it. And so, I mean, when we go out into the public, that being wrong is also an option. And the consequences are broad, broader, right? Um, Nobody sees me cry over the second reader's comments, um, but they're going to see, you know, the public matter. They're going to see me being wrong in public. And if the university doesn't have your back, then how are you supposed to engage in this kind of work? So I think academic freedom becomes uh, the freedom to also be wrong sometimes with, you know, good scholarship and good intentions and all the rest of that. Very, very important point, John. You know, failure is important and failures, failure is often the, you know, the ground of, of innovation if you're not 
allowed to fail, uh, then, uh, you know, it's... Uh, um, all right, any other questions or um, two minutes out? Are we done, Rebecca? Hi there, uh, we will wrap up. I have about 30 seconds worth of things to say right at the very end. So if there is one more question, we can probably uh, do that. We should end right at 1130 if possible though. Okay, anybody else, any other questions? And go ahead, Rudd, or final comments by the panel, Rudd. Just one little comment <clears throat> and it came up in the in the chat a bit, the training, you know, I've received zero training. I, you know, haven't gone looking for it. It may exist, but um, I don't know where to find it. And I think maybe it's time for the university if they, they probably already do, and we just don't know it's there. So forgive me if it's available, but maybe we need to publicize it a bit better. But, you know, I think, I think we need some uh, opportunity for training. And, you know, even if you just <laughs> took a transcript of this conversation and gave it to some people, they might benefit. I think that exists actually Mar at Mark Communication. Dave Sorensen uh, has some experience and is uh, is is uh, yeah. So, but maybe this is something we need to make make more. Uh, people don't know about that. You know, some people might say, "Oh, you're a natural. It's fine." But sometimes it's 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 maybe not enough to be to be a natural. That's a that's a good point. Or and and certainly people who are more experienced with it could uh, could help help. Others, we need to find ways. But again, let's not for, forget that it's not just about media presence, right? Public scholarship is also about these deep connections with our communities. And uh, uh, as John said, they're not a, a block of people, right? So it's reaching out to our diverse uh, communities uh, for you know to continue that rich two-way conversation. All right. Any final comments? We have more. One more minute. Anybody has a final word to say? Silence. All right. Maybe I'll fill the silence. <laughs> thank you so much, folks. I want to give a, a big round of applause and thank yous to our panel. You were all wonderful. Uh, Isabel, you're hosting, uh, really kept things moving in interesting directions. We really appreciate it. This session has been recorded and we will be sharing it through various different uh, media. Uh, and we will send an email with some of the uh, various like links and ideas and, uh, and and things like that that uh, came up in the chat. If there are things that are worth sharing, we'll do the same uh, through an email. So once again, thank you so much. Much appreciated. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks.